Have you ever felt a chill down your spine or felt strange when walking into a building? Do you sense something that isn't physically there? Have you seen unexplained objects in the sky or, or felt something unearthly sitting on the edge of your bed or seen ghostly figures move past you? Amanda and I will be delving below the surface to question just a few of the paranormal activities that happen in our everyday lives. And we'll be sharing people's stories and phenomena from around the world, famous stories you may have heard of and new tales. That may chill you to the bone. So welcome to our paranormal show. Uh, <laughs> I love that intro, it's so dramatic. Hi everyone, I hope you're all brilliantly well. Um, welcome to our first um, paranormal show ever. It's really nice to have you all out there. Um, how are you, Amanda? Are you excited? I'm so excited about tonight's show. It's lovely to be here with you, Mitch, doing this and sharing our passions. Because what was your reason behind wanting to do this? Well, when I was young, much younger, and um, I was really, really into the paranormal when I was sort of um, 14, 15, 16, and then life took over and I went off into and did loads of other things. And it's only now that I'm having time to re-explore it again. So um, although I get lots of senses and see and feel lots of things, I'm relearning everything. But I know with you, you have had, well, since you're a girl, you've, you've been developing this extraordinary talent ever since you were, what, eight years old? <laughs> Yes, eight years old. Well, I've been fascinating. I've been, I've been healing and working with that when I was eight years old. And also my dad was really trained in the art of psychometry, which is reading people's uh, sort of past from the objects that he holds. And also he was trained as somebody that was a spirit guide, somebody to help the spirits that got lost. So the World War One soldiers who got blown up, you know, tragically didn't know that they were dead. My mm. dad night would hardly sleep because he'd say he'd be helping them to cross over to the other side guiding them talking to them telling them what had happened and that it's time for them to move forward so i've kind of been steeped in otherworldly things from such a, a a young age so i'm really excited to see what we've got coming up for us today as well this well, evening i know you've got loads of tales but everyone else has been sending in their tales as well so we've got your tales which are the public and friends have sent their information and we've also got lengro tales now lengro is the magazine and it's the lengro family so they've been hard at work um getting stuff together for us as well haven't they so thank you everyone for joining us just to let you know facebook has had a bit of an issue at the moment about um lives so some lives are cutting out if it does cut out just come back to this link and we'll re go live and also when you listen to all the contributions um, you may need to put the volume up and down on, on different things because people have recorded them at different volumes but we are going to have lots of fun and learn lots and see lots and hear lots of amazing amazing stories um Comment and get involved, I suppose. Comment and get involved, and we'll bring up your comments as we go, probably over some of the footage. Um, but it's well, I'm so excited, Amanda. And you know what? It's time for our very first spooky tales. Hi, everyone. So I've got two minutes to tell a 10 minute story. I've been asked to drop it down, so here goes. Uh, this is for Mitch uh, and, the, and the crew. So um, I wanna tell this story. I'm Simon, by the way, uh, and I, from Worthing, I'd like to tell this story. Many, many years ago, I worked as a estate agent and um, we were selling a property. It, a property, we, we used to just get lots of properties that would come on the market uh, quite frequently. But uh, this one hadn't ever come to market, uh, certainly not in the past 70 odd years. Property came to market. Uh, it was really old school inside. It was in Cranworth Road in Worthing, quite a well-known road, Victorian property. Uh, taking people round the property, potential viewers buy it. Uh, always felt very, very uneasy, very cold property. And um, one particular time, up the stairs into the main bedroom following the last people out of the day we'd had lots of people in all day long uh turn the corner come out the bedroom always felt cold always felt super super eerie 
turned on the landing to come down the stairs, to come out the front door and standing in the doorway, hands on hips, bold as brass, fury in the absolute face of the lady, dressed in period clothing from like 70, 80 years ago. Lady standing there with the most upset face that you have ever seen. Something like, you know, you could take you back to your childhood where you've done something wrong and your mum would pull that face. That's the face. Uh, Hasten to say the hairs went up, arms, neck, everything, left the property, absolutely terrified. Uh, and the property sold, don't know what happened thereafter. That I believe is two minutes over and out. Uh, right, uh, scenario that happened at my house when I was a little girl. Actually, I've had about three different ones happen. So the first one, this didn't really happen to me, this happened to my father. Uh, so we were living in a 550 year old cottage and um, a few things used to go on. And I remember, it was like it was one of the hottest days in the summer, like really, really hot. And my father was outside in the garden doing some gardening. And he looked up. Oh, I think I've got a friend here. Look, come to join me. There she is. He looked up and saw that there's smoke pouring out the chimney. And he was just like, why is my mother, why has she lit the fire? It's boiling today. So he went inside and shouted and said, why have you lit the fire? She said, I haven't lit the fire. And he went in, of course, the fire wasn't lit. But there was smoke pouring out the chimney. Mm. Lots of strange things like that. I might have another one. I'll come back to you. Hi. Uh, a little um, paranormal story for you. So I was about 12 or 13 at home doing my makeup in the mirror. So if like, I was looking in the mirror and you could see all the way down to the bottom of the hallway. So my nan had died a couple of years before and my sister had unfortunately lost a baby um, a couple of weeks before, very late on in the pregnancy. So I was just doing my bits and bobs in the mirror and then I saw my nan behind me at the end of the hallway holding a baby. I turned and she walked into the lounge so I walked into the lounge, followed, and then she just disappeared. And all I could, um, it was just very cold, and I could just smell her Lily of the Valley perfume really strong for about five minutes, and, and then she was gone. So there you go. Spooky. <laughs>well that is spooky because um smells are really important aren't they i mean i when my dad passed away sometimes i occasionally smell um smoke but it's just well the cigarette smoke you know but it smells exactly like his tobacco used to so i'm like I just, and it doesn't scare me i just go oh dad's around or it might be johnny johnny smells it and says oh mum's around but they're a different smell and then you go back and they're gone yeah so <laughs> I've had that with my granny and also for my granny it was the lily of the valley as well whenever I smell that I know that she's around but you know if there are negative spirits around then you can get really awful smells it can smell like rotten egg, egg sulfur mildew really really bad I mean if I smell a bad smell I normally blame it on the dog but you know, <laughs> under these circumstances it's 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 worth knowing sometimes when you smell those smells it's a clue of something else going on well but, I mean, go on sorry Amanda no, I was just about to say, talking of nice smells, though, I yeah. think we've got to call someone on that really smells nice and knows about nice smells. Who is that going to be, Mitch? Well, she's our specialist from Lengro um, in aromatherapy, and she always smells nice. And <laughs> I'm sure she'd love the introduction. She'd be welcome her. This is the lovely Sam. Hello, well, darling. I appreciate everyone telling me that I smell nice. I know. Yeah. 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 Paranormal now, smelling. <laughs> Welcome, Danny. You are our first. Um, you are our first guest. You are our first live guest. I'm um, honoured, obviously, well, to be on this amazing show that has already got the goosebumps coming out now already. Well, you, <laughs> said, <laughs> you said. Um, you said to me um, that you'd gone to America on well uh, on holiday, and then you you've got a story to tell, and it's a really good ghost story. But did you go to America for the ghost story, um, or I mean, to, to hunt ghosts or? Or what? What happened? No, we basically went. We got on a plane, me and my mum, um, got on a road trip. Obviously, lots of Lengro regulars will know. 
all the funny things that happened on that particular road trip, as I've heard it on Langro Lies. Um, but we literally just got the car and just decided where we'd end up. And we ended up in Charleston in the historical district. Now, I didn't know anything about it 100%. We just were like, no, we're tired. We just want to have a quick look around. It was perfect ghost creepy weather because it was raining and foggy. Uh, so we literally went, checked in, had a bit of a wander around as you do, went to bed. Didn't think anything else of it. A few hours later, I woke up and there was a man standing at the end of my bed. I was more concerned that someone had broken in, in all honesty. Um, and then I looked at him and he was in, well, he was in a waistcoat, very, very smart suit. Think Carson out of Downton Abbey, just with grey hair. That is how he looked. And I was like, mm, this is a little bit weird. And then as I tried to speak, all I could feel was this pressure on my throat. And it just would not go away. Every single time I tried to speak, just push, push, push. And eventually I was just like, no, this is silly. I lent, rolled over, turned on the light. And as I turned back, he'd gone. I was like, OK, yeah, I must have been dreaming. Didn't think much else of it. Went back to sleep again. The following morning, went to check out. And the woman behind the reception desk was checking in another couple and was explaining about the history of the building and how they have a resident ghost who wanders the second floor. And as she started saying that, I was like, oh, I'm really sorry to interrupt. I was quite shy back then. Not that you believe it. <laughs> I was like, sorry to interrupt, but I think he was in our room last night. And she was like, no, 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 he never goes in a room. She went, just describe him then. So I did. I, I described him, I explained exactly what happened. She was clearly shaken. And she was like, I've never heard him go into anybody's room before. I was like, well, yeah, he was definitely there. I didn't stick around, I'm not gonna lie. I had a book, I'd then booked a tour in Savannah, a ghost hunting tour, and I couldn't go the following night because I was so scared that someone would jump out at me again. Yes, I am that much of a baby. <laughs> Well, well done for living to tell the tale. What a fabulous spooky tale for us today, darling, tonight. Thank you for that, yeah. You're more than welcome. Now I need to run away and hide behind the sofa to hear the rest Indeed. of the show. We're gonna we know that I'm scary. Away. Like, There's more scary really things happening. We love yeah. you, Sam. Thanks so much for sharing your story. Bye. See you later. Bye-bye. Disappear. She's oh, gone. She's gone. She's, she's disappeared. Oh, well, like that. She just went. That's amazing, mate. How is that possible? I don't know how is that possible. <laughs> Amanda, you must yeah. have you've got a story of everything. So I'm going to ask you, do you have a story about America and an American <laughs> ghost? Funny, Funny you enough. That, Rich. <laughs> Yeehaw, I do indeed. I do indeed. Because I was going with my son for a, a, a three week uh, sort of road trip. Amazing. And we went to this Winchester house in America. It's very, very well known, really spooky and famous. And I'm going to read you a little bit about this. So Sarah Lockwood Winchester. Now, she was the wife of the gun magnate William Wirt Winchester, whose family created the Winchester rifle that was heralded as the gun that won the West. So it was designed and oversaw this, this house, this sprawling manor. But many believe that Sarah, the wife, built Winchester House out of fear. She was overcome with grief at the wake of her husband's death from tuberculosis in 1881. And folklore states that Sarah sought out a spiritualist who could commune with the dead. Now, while she was presumably looking for solace or closure, she was instead given a chilling warning. Through the medium, William told his widow that their tragedies, because the couple had only one child, a daughter named Annie, who died at six weeks old, they were a result of the blood money the family had made off the Winchester rifles. And he warned that vengeful ghosts would seek her out. And in order to protect herself, William said that Sarah must build a home for herself and for the spirits who have fallen from this terrible weapon. So Sarah was advised to leave their home in New Haven and move west, where she was to build this enormous grand home, which we went to see for her and the spirits. But there was just one catch. Construction on the house could never stop. If you continue building, you will live, the medium warned. Sarah, if you stop, you will die. So she built this house, which we went to see, and there are 
millions and what thousands of rooms, hundreds of rooms with doors that go nowhere, all can to confuse the spirits and the angry spirits and the ghosts. And she employed this crew of carpenters and they worked for 52 weeks a year for 38 years. And the work only stopped in 1922 when Sarah finally died of a heart failure in her sleep. And it's said that upon hearing the news of Sarah's death, the carpenters quit so abruptly that they left half hammered nails protruding from the walls. So wow. I think now, you know what, I think we've got to hear some of our viewers more ghostly <laughs> tales, don't you think, after that? Absolutely. Let's hear that. <laughs> me again so another paranormal story again didn't happen to me but did happen to my grandmother now my grandmother things used to happen to her all the time uh so grandma and grandpa were in bed and grandpa got up to go and use the bathroom and then a couple of minutes later she felt grandpa get back into bed rolled over and started to go to sleep and then about Three minutes later, she felt Grandpa really get back into bed. They did have to move from that house. She never slept in that bedroom again. And I don't blame her. Me again. Oh, you've made me wonky. Me again. Hi. So, my sister had a poltergeist in her house. So it moved lots of things around when the kids were young. And um, the kids would often be talking to uh, something. And anyway, then it started to become a bit of an issue, keeping the kids awake at night and moving stuff around the house. And I remember one day my sister came back from holiday and we were unpacking her clothes and we just heard this girl, must be, she, I think it was probably about seven or eight, just giggling behind us. It was, yeah, it was just like, well, so my sister wasn't scared of her, but she decided to get someone in to uh, cleanse the house and then um, she was gone. So yeah, there you go. <laughs> Wow, cleansing the house. They were great stories. Um, I've, I've watched a lot of films, you know, those sort of, you know, like The Exorcist and sort of getting rid of spirits and, and different things like that. But Amanda, you do some work that's very similar, don't you? But it's, what's it called? So, well, for me, it's like spirit release or house blessings or house cleansings or house clearings. Um, so it's my work as a celebrant, you know, I will go into a, a place, sometimes get called in, particularly if there's been some unhappy goings on or, uh, you know, a couple that had the house before have divorced, trying, you know, where you have an imprint of an energy. So yeah. I will use my pendulum to give me some guidance on what needs to be cleared, where needs to be cleared. But I can't always do it myself. And actually, I was living in a place where it was uh, amazing. It was right next to an old converted that used to be an old dairy. And every night before going to the, to the toilet in the night, I had to walk down the stairs. And on the stairs was this outline, the shadowy figure of a woman, a kind of dairy maid looking woman. And I actually had to walk through her every night to get to oh the and come back out. And in my very English way, I'd say, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Sorry. I did try to say and try to use all my skill and everything to move her on. But nothing was, was working. So I had to call in a couple who are really experts at this. And they ascertained that what had happened was that she had been pregnant with the man that owned the, 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 the dairy. And actually, her little boy was four years old. Um, had ended up being killed by him oh and God. she was so shocked and devastated when she died that actually she was looking over the little boy that lived next door in real time who was four years old and yeah. she was guarding him and she wouldn't leave so the woman the couple that came the woman herself what she did was she managed to kind of activate herself as a portal so she would say that she'd bring in this huge amount of light. You could really feel this energy, huge amount of light. And then the spirit would go through into that light and then where it was needing to go. But yeah. what was interesting was she did that work and the, literally the ghost had gone. There was no, I wasn't walking through that anymore. Yeah, so I find that really fascinating. And, you yeah. know, we've got an expert to talk about that. I'm very lucky to have us with a marvellous Terry O'Sullivan, who is one of the leading leading experts on 
ghosts and ghost releases and, and, and hauntings and all of those things. He deals with the big heavy guns, but he's just going to talk to us a little bit about the difference between ghosts and spirits and just give us some things to think about, Mitch. So I think maybe it's time to play that interview. Okay. <laughs> ghost but there are so many different types of um, ghost and I think you know just to sort of give you a description mm. we have to go back into um, tribal or um, natural cultures where people believed that everything was spirit and this is something which you know whether you go into the Native American Indian you look behind me, you can see my African tradition as a Sangoma, which is like a, a shaman. Um, and of course, with these traditions, I'm a shaman, you believe everything is spirit. But equally, if you are a Tibetan Buddhist, you will also believe everything is spirit. So it, 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 it's, it's a very interesting concept, because if you're looking at... Um, let's say the Western religions, which don't believe in reincarnation, the Western religions are sort of looking at a ghost as being somebody who's died, and then they happen to be either hanging around or they moved on and come back. But the thing is, if you look at um, the religion in general, the Christian religion as an example, you are talking about Father, Son and Holy Ghost, if you're Church of England. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, if you're Catholic. Ghost, Spirit, two definitions which are similar, but entirely separate in their meaning. Yes, fascinating. Entirely separate in their meaning. I mean, a ghost is something that you sort of think of, you know, a horror movie or something going to really, really scare you. Whereas you talk about the Holy Spirit and you're thinking, well, what's the Holy, goodness gracious, be an angel it could be something really lovely you know so these are the extremes that you do get within the dimensions of spirit so you you get those very sort of um wonderful absolutely gorgeous spirits and they are vibrant so vibrant in their light and you can often see these spirits if you meditate as an example um you may feel that there is a presence around you which is giving you a great warmth. So instead of seeing a visual, you are sensing the impression of the spirit being there. And these are the ways that these really dynamic spirits relate to you, they have encounters with you. And they're all to do with love, they're to do with benevolence, compassion, and good things like that. And then of course the other extreme, is what some people refer to as the DFE, the dark force entity, which is a conglomerate of different types of spirit, which can cause you harm, um, can cause you difficulty. But if you are walking the same road as someone like um, a Sangama or a shaman, then you have to recognize that these are your challenge. So there's a different perspective if you're not sort of taking your spiritual journey seriously, um, then there is no need to entertain ghosts or spirits. But if you are taking your journey seriously, then you have no choice because they will make themselves known to you. Well, thanks for that, Terry. He is a completely fascinating man. I mean, he knows so much, doesn't he? And um, talking about ghosts, Amanda, um, I know that you were out on the trail a few weeks ago and you found yourself at Heber Castle with your son, Ben. Should we take a little look at the footage? Absolutely. Let's play it. All right. <laughs> So can you say your name and what you've been feeling at Heaver Castle? Uh, my name is Ben Waring and yeah, I mean the castle and the grounds are really lovely. And it's, it's, a, it's amazing the history being in there, but I've seen some things. <laughs> I've seen, no, but seriously, I have seen, I'm definitely not really a believer in ghosts or things like that, but to my own 
I don't know how to word that, to my own dismay, I guess. <laughs> I definitely have seen, on multiple occasions, I keep seeing a white, a, a figure dressed in white, kind of flowing gown, sort of trailing through the bedrooms, and Anne Boleyn's bedroom, and the Waldegrave room, and uh, I'm filming there at the moment, and I'm up there setting the lights by myself, and, I, and as soon as I see it, I go and check the room, and there's, I've, every time I've checked, and nobody in there, I'm like, I, it was definitely someone walking past, but um, yeah, so it's a bit weird, but uh, apart from that, it's, it's a really beautiful castle and amazing engravings, but yeah, it's just very interesting how I keep seeing this, this figure. We've got one more day in the castle, so if I don't make it out, I'll let you know. So here I am, here at the incredible Hever Castle, and I am here with my psychic dog, Indy. There she's sniffing out, seeing if she can sniff any ghosts because this was the home of Anne Boleyn. And it is said that her ghost can be seen wandering the grounds. And also you can see her on Christmas Eve at one of these windows. And it has been said that there have been other ghosts here too, especially a headless horseman riding on a beautiful white horse. And there's been unexplained apparitions in the gardens of other ghosts here. And it certainly feels incredibly timeless. This place is a real find if any of you want to come and feel the atmosphere here. It's absolutely breathtaking. It's peaceful, but it's also eerie in a strange way. And apparently at the windows up there, Anne Boleyn has been found scrabbling at the windows, desperately clawing, shaking her fist at the window, trying to get out. Though she was beheaded at the Tower of London, Apparently it feels that she's come here, back to her home, where she was happy for a time. All I can think of now is Anne Boleyn scratching at the window, just that image won't leave my head. I know, it's so, it's so, so dramatically, oh, so, so sad as well, so tragic for her. And also, there's more stories there, more hauntings. When I was coming out of there, there was a, a visitor guide there, and he said, oh, I just wanted to tell you that actually there's another ghost there that was apparently one of the old families that were there at the time of when they had to do the priest holes and the, the monks, were the, I think it was the, the, the resident vicar or priest, whatever, had to go into the priest hole. And the family then left and said, oh, we'll come back for you. We'll get you out of the priest hole and the persecutions that were going on. And the family never came back. And so he just died in this priest hole. And this visitor guide says he really senses and feels and knows that that ghost is there. So what he does mm -hmm. is every time he goes in, he says to him, you're not forgotten. I remember you're not forgotten. And again, he's not a ghost that is easily released either. Sometimes ghosts just literally can't. They're just stuck in that astral plane and it's like, glue and they can't always move on yeah so really, really interesting but i think now we've got to move on haven't we from haunted kent should we move on to haunted hertfordshire with jack tyler yeah brilliant well let's roll the vt so here we are back on datchford three and I've got joining me today spirit medium, Sophia Marie Ferguson. Hi. <laughs> now, hi. So, Sophia, you've, um, we've obviously, I've had readings with you before. Yeah. Um, and you, you know, you, you have different ways of working to, uh, to other mediums mm -hmm. and things, but you've actually experienced some sort of phenomena around in this area, haven't you? Yeah, I have. Yeah. So it was in um, the late summer and I was doing a reading for somebody in this area in um, like their summer house at the end of their garden. And then towards the end of the reading, the sun had set and it was now um, dusk and I could see I, something kept catching me out the corner of my eye and I had to feel like I kept turning around and when I looked over I could actually see lots of different spirit people um, how I see them are as beams of light and they had like um, 
like a, a like a shadow around them. And when I told the lady yeah. oh, what I was seeing, she said, "Oh, actually, this is quite um, a, a haunted area with many stories." And the graveyard was yeah. just behind us, so she said it wasn't uncommon to, for people to have seen spirit people, especially going towards the church itself. Yeah. yeah. So, do you have any idea who these sort of these people are? are? They just people that are making their way to the graveyard. Do you think it's people that are buried there? Or? Yeah, they just kind of come up across the field out of yeah. nowhere and we were just walking towards us but I just felt like they were making their way like making their journey towards right. that area yeah 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 because this, this is like a really haunted area Dashworth and we were talking earlier about um you know because we're both quite skeptical but obviously we do believe and we were wondering why is it you know that people see um people from the olden days in white you know in grey cloaks and and things like that um but how so how how do you see people so when I see um, spirit people, it comes in two, it come in two different forms. So one yeah. of the forms I used to see it as from a child until now would be um, what I call the shadow people, and they come um, like a shadow, literally like a dark smoke shadow, um, and they come very quickly. The shadow people. So you'll turn around and then they'll be gone, or you'll be looking in a mirror. So often yeah. you'll see them quite a lot in the mirrors, and they'll flip past you, or you can see them physically wandering backwards and forwards, and that is a form of physical mediumship that you'll be seeing. Um, spirit in that form. Yeah. Other times, this rare sighting is when you see them in their complete, in my my feeling of the complete spirit form, which is when they're a pure white light. Yeah. So that's how I or how I see it, and that's what I would call physical mediumship. Yeah. And do you think these people that have been seen are they like are they all lost souls? Are they, you know, looking for for people yeah. and you know? Um, I think. <laughs> I think really it, it goes back, it can go quite back quite far and I feel like a lot of people when they cross over if they've had quite traumatic events often they don't know their place of where to go yeah. so I feel like that's why they come back because they're so traumatised they don't, they get confused maybe yes if they've passed over they've got their families with them which they're comforted by but I believe that all souls once they cross over they do have a purpose and they do have a journey yeah. um, and sometimes if they've been through a traumatic experience they may come back to that past life right. rather than moving on yeah, so it's kind of like a limbo situation. In like situation. a limbo situation. Yeah. So would you have any idea what, when they would finally realise that it's time to go? In my experience, yeah. from when they've come through, even um, not people from hundreds of years ago, even just people who may have died a few years ago, yeah. in my experience, it, it's fleeting. So they'll only come back for fleeting opportunities. They won't be here for weeks or months on end. They'll just come back for fleeting opportunities. Yeah. A bit like when we dream and we wake up and we might think, Oh, where did we go there? That's felt so real. Yeah. Some people would believe that that's a past life and you're going back to that past life. Right. And that was quite a fleeting opportunity. And then yes. you come back again. It's a little bit similar for when spirit cross over and then they come back again. Yeah. It happens just quite fleetingly. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's, that's absolutely fascinating. So I just want to ask quickly, can you feel anything this evening? Is there anything... Mm. I haven't really tuned in, but I'm very drawn to this area over here, just yeah. towards the cricket basket across there but then also I'm very drawn across this area yeah, as well because that is where the the churchyard is um, oh, green and I would see I can see probably three ladies in that area walking towards us now wow. from across that tree towards yeah. us now um, I feel elderly ladies I feel like they're in their 60s 70s I feel like they would have lived here all their lives I see them again in white clothing I see one in um, like a pinafore dress like a, a mock pin, like a pinafore top on yeah. her and I can see her well, with white hair with red coming um, towards us I feel like she would have been a mother differently and um, a sister with her and possibly a younger child as well yeah. Wow, that is fascinating that is really amazing Oh, thank you, thank you so You're much so for being That's amazing Thank you Wow, I love how Sophia sees ghosts. She calls them the shadow people. I love that. And um, oh, Amanda, you've seen loads of ghosts, obviously. Are they all the same? I mean, you mentioned some earlier. How do yeah, you see it, them? Well, I so I had this really amazing experience where a bit like with the colour, like an orb. So I was in this incredibly beautiful house in Swanage, and I was awake. You know, my partner was asleep beside me, but I saw this a strange kind of purple light that just got bigger and bigger coming towards beside my bed. And then through this light, 
it solidified and actually this being this man came to sit beside my bed as as real as you are i mean it was like solid 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 and i didn't move i wasn't frightened at all because the energy of this man felt very benevolent and he was mouthing and he was trying to say something to me but no words were coming out and he was really looking at me and he i went to wake up my partner to say look 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 <laughs> and when i went back typical you know that had then disappeared he disappeared but then i got up out of the bed in a kind of strange trance-like feeling and i walked down the stairs and my partner followed me and said what's going on and i just went straight into this they had a big library there I walked straight into the library i walked straight towards one book pulled it out of the bookshelf and there on the cover was this man that i had seen in this cloth cap he had a very specific cloth cap and a, and a, a, quite a unique beard and he was a, a poet and an author that had lived in that house and i was writing a book at the time and i felt like he was giving me real uh, support and encouragement and it was really amazing my partner was kind of amazed that i would have gone just there and straight for that book too so yeah sometimes it's really like really uplifting yeah it's like somebody from the past coming um forward to give yeah oh mitch give you that support and it's a really nice heartwarming story i mean i've seen i've sort of seen ghosts and spirits and feel spirits and feel forces and things like that but i i've seen loads of things in the sky you know when you're, you're looking out and there's a light and you think it's venus you know the brightest star of you think, is it venus it's really bright it's something and then it suddenly disappears mum and dad used to see loads of things in portugal in the night sky they, they suddenly appear and disappear um so so i don't anyway i'm going on about ufos but we've actually got sandra who's um, who sent us in some well her tale should we have a listen to her ufo sighting absolutely hi everybody i'm sandra chester and i live in turin village around four years ago my husband and i were coming back from cuffley and we were driving along this lane here which is from archers green up to grass warren and just here on this corner uh, about halfway between here and the tree up there we spotted a big white light about 200 foot up in the air so we stopped here wound down the window and uh, within a couple of seconds it had just completely vanished there was no sound um, it had just completely gone and then about six months later where that tree is above it again it was quite low this big white light from my bedroom window which is up on the top of the hill there um, again another one of these lights was spotted um, yeah whether it was a UFO whatever I don't know I do believe there's something out there um, but that's that's all I've experienced here in this village but I do believe in the local paper years ago there was a similar sighting around where that tree is up on the hill thank you wow that's so cool that's so amazing yeah. and also it reminds me because another sort of story for me with ufos was i was in spain and on this beautiful mountainous road and again with my partner we were driving back from a, a, a dinner party a friend had a house up in the mountains and as we were driving down it was about midnight in front of us i mean not directly in front of us but down the road we could see there was no other traffic nothing at all this big light was like the size of a double decker bus like again a, a light that you can't even describe the colors because it was can't explain it this is what's so hard about mm -hmm. these things is that it yeah. was a feeling of it this color of this light and everything we looked at each other and everything went into slow motion it was as if time had stopped still it was the freakiest thing where i just felt like we both did time days could have passed we had no idea and we looked back at each other and looked back. We've both seen it again. So there's the confirmation, the affirmation, you know, you're, you're not going mad. You are seeing something with someone else there. Yeah. Um, and, and it had disappeared. And wow. 
we were really shaky driving back because the feeling was it didn't feel very nice. It yeah. didn't feel it didn't feel like a nice good vibe. It actually felt very uh very sort of unnerving and and disturbing and and the fact that it then it just disappeared yeah. and i think you know again i mean look i think we've got to talk about things that appear and disappear and then disappear for good and i think maybe this is where we should get the wonderful claire petulengro to come okay. on and talk to us about the bermuda triangle let's play it <laughs> Do you know about the Bermuda Triangle? <laughs> or do you just think you know? As the plane dipped into the area of the Atlantic Ocean, bordered by Bermuda, Puerto Rico, and Fort Lauderdale, Florida, known as the Devil's Triangle, or the place of the lost souls in 1945, Flight 19 disappeared never to be found again. He wasn't the only one, as not one, but six American planes in good flying condition have all been documented as going off radar, vanishing without sight, never to be seen again. Planes and boats have also been reported to have vanished and turned up again, but minus their crew and passengers. But the loss of Flight 19 from Fort Lauderdale, Florida, was perhaps one of the most notable. According to Viking legends who call this area the Poison Sea, those who in the early days made the trip from Europe to the Americas reported strange bright lights and brightly glowing balls above and below the water. Aliens, perhaps, from another world. The pilots of modern planes later reported difficulty in radar systems working and in some instances, sudden loss of power to engines and electrical failure. Instrumental panels went haywire and had great difficulty in keeping their planes on course or at the correct altitude. <laughs> Think it's all boulder dash? What's my theory? I think the supernatural concept of leftover technology from the mythical lost continent of Atlantis. Perhaps it's really a portal. There's said to be a submerged rock formation known as the Bimini Road off the island of Bimini in the Bahamas, which is in the Triangle. Followers of the psychic Edward Case predicted that evidence would be found in 1968. And that's the date that Bimini Road was indeed found. It's a natural structure, road or wall, and who knows to where or what it leads to. Would you really take your chances to find out? Well, I absolutely love the way Claire tells a story, and I've always loved the Bermuda Triangle as well. And I, I've just seen so many films, so many documentaries on it, and the fact that they pinpointed these three points and everything happens within them is, you know, just that's fascinating, which is the word for tonight. Fascinating, isn't it? Absolutely, darling. You said you wouldn't play it. <laughs> But I think it's amazing with that because I've flown over the Bermuda Triangle a few times now and they actually tell you when you're flying over it and it's like, I don't really want to know actually right now. And I think, you know, we were diverted because there was a hurricane. So we, we had to fly over it. And all I imagined was the pilot sort of going, we are now flying over the Bermuda Tri... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Didn't want to tell you. But a, I need play lines. Yeah, you know, no, that's what I was going to say about these the, the triangles and the lines. Do we have anything like that in our country? Is it an energy line? Is it what? What, yeah, what is it? So it's it's fascinating because actually, you know, ley lines they were first theorised in 1921, and there's been a debate over whether they exist or if they don't, and what purpose they serve. But actually, those that believe in ley lines, and and you know, I certainly can sense them and feel them. Um, 
they say that there are lines of energy running over ground in straight lines, often reflected in ancient trackway lines and alignments of prehistoric and historic sacred sites in the landscape. So they're connecting it all. And it says that ley lines are properly defined as straight overground energy lines that echo the sinuous path of larger underground rivers. And that in some beliefs that they carry yang chi, this energy, relative to the yin chi of the underground water and are often associated with heavenly consciousness and human spiritual development and ceremonial sites. So these paths are not appropriate. <laughs> the ley lines are not appropriate for normal living. Houses built on them are generally not advised because they are a thoroughfare for all manner of spirit traffic. Uh, so you don't want to be there on that ley line. And also discovering that actually a lot of the um, Christian churches are built on ley lines and are built on the areas which the ancient cultures, those the pagan worships, knew about and felt about. And so the, the, the Christian church would build over those sacred sites that belonged to the ancient cultures. So there's something... What to bring the energy, or or how how it yeah. works? It's it's fascinating to find out, and anybody that's out there, viewers that want to, to to share a little bit if they know about this, I think that on some levels it's people saying that they're it's coming over, or on one level it was to prevent any energy that was coming from religions that weren't perhaps of the Christian faith at that time, but also if it, they are portals of energy and where there can be connections to other worlds. That's really interesting to think about and know about. And actually talking about you know places where there's other world connections and ancient and old sites, we've got the fabulous Laura Ann, who yes. is going to share a little bit about her time at the very wonderful magical A3. Should we play that tape? We shall. <laughs> Hello Langro. So it's me, Laura Ann. I am here at A3 Stone Circle. So if you don't know where A3 Stone Circle is, it is in Wiltshire. It's uh, the largest stone circle in Europe, built in the Neolithic Age, which is the New Stone Age. And the energy here is absolutely incredible. So many amazing things, stories, views, as you can see behind me. So here we have a free stone circle and that's just one part of the stone circle it actually it stretches right the way over there all behind me all the way over there as well so you can see the lambs are out as well and um yeah welcome to a free stone circle next i'm going to take you over to the wishing tree that is the wishing trees and they're also known as jrr tolkien's trees so here I am at the Avebury Wishing or Talking Trees. These are the trees that inspired J.R.R. Tolkien, the Lord of the Rings. So as you can see, there's lots of ribbons and bits hanging on the trees. They're tied into the roots. The roots are incredible. So these trees, people come to to hang a ribbon, to make a wish, to sort of put their hopes and dreams, to maybe tie ribbons to remember their loved ones. You can see there's some tied to the roots all over the other side, but they're there's a dream catcher on there. It's just gorgeous. Such a spe special energy here. So I'll just take you further down the roots. So if you ever come to Avery, remember to take a ribbon or a bit of fabric or something. There you go. Oh, all tied on there. Such a special place. Really, really special. So this is the wishing and talking trees. How incredible is that? So beautiful. Behind me here is the Red Lion Inn, the pub at Avery, which is well known for its hauntings. One of the hauntings in Horton is the Phantom Carriage, drawn by ghostly horses which can sometimes be seen crossing the courtyard. Legend says that if you happen to see a horse drawn carriage, that it is a bad moment that means that a close relative is soon to die. Another well known haunting here in the pub happens in the Avenue. Where it says the two children play and laugh at the night. The most well known haunting at the Red Line Inn is that of Flory, the female phantom. 
The story of Florrie goes that she was having an affair with a man when her husband caught them both in the act. The husband shot the man and slit Florrie's throat. He then dragged her to the well, threw her down and chucked down a boulder on top of her to make sure that her body stayed there. It's said that Florrie's often been seen wandering through the inn and people that go there for drinks or lunch have seen her as well. So that's me wrapping up for my little trip to Avery Stone Circle. As you can see, I'm right down among some of the stones here. There's the road there. The stone circle goes right the way around. It's the largest stone circle in Europe, even bigger than Stonehenge. In fact, Avery is a much calmer, nicer energy than Stonehenge. Stonehenge is obviously a very big tourist attraction, very commercialised, whereas Avery is also an attraction, but it's very much go with the flow. There's no tourist centre, there's no guidebooks around, it's just kind of come and enjoy it and, and just go with that flow. So that is me for a trip to A3 for Lengro and I hope you've enjoyed. Well, I think I will have pub at lunch at that pub and watch out for Florrie as well. That's an amazing place. I'd never actually heard of it, although Laura Ann was saying that it's, uh, you know, not a very commercial place. I'd never heard of it, but um, at a free stone circle. But you do lots of work there, don't you, Amanda? No, I love it there. Love it there. And being in the pub too. I've done lots of baby naming ceremonies there and high and fasting weddings and new moon ceremonies and full moon ceremonies there because the energy there, you know, like Laura Ann said, it's very gentle. It's Stonehenge is it's different. Stonehenge is a is is a much sort of darker energy place. But Avery has something phenomenal and calming about it. And actually, I find it really fascinating that when I go there with my dog, my dog becomes so peaceful, really mm. super chilled amongst the stones. It's really unusual to see. I think it's a bit like the New Forest, where I've never heard of Avery, which I'd love to go to. But um, the New Forest, when you drive through and then you suddenly slow down and the pace of life changes and you've got the horses walking across and the animals and it's absolutely um, beautiful. And um, you know what? We've got a good horse link with our next one. This is another Lengro um, tale. Should we play this? This is Joe. So I'm, I'm doing a voiceover for this. This is a story that Jack sent in from a lady, Joe. <laughs> I'm reading the words of Joe Shaw, who sent these pictures in. You can see the orbs flying about here. This horse had liver disease and had about four weeks before the owners were going to have her put down. I gave her several healing sessions and she is healthy now. The lights on her body went from pink to yellow to white. Once white light is seen, I know enough healing has taken place. Also, when I join my energy with others, they too get lights, but slightly different shades, so we can be working with the same horse and get purple, but their colour will be slightly different. I guess it's each of us having our own fractal energy, producing a slightly different energy, and light mingling with the horse's energy and light body. <laughs> Well, I'm saying here and now that if if um if I ever meet anybody that doesn't like animals, I don't trust them because I think animals are just a, a complete and utter blessing, and I think they're so tuned into you. Um, our dog Callie, for instance, when my dad was ill, um, she used to go upstairs and look after my mum and dad. And then when my dad passed away, she looked after my mum every single night. She snuggled up to her right up to her um, neck and slept slept in the um you know nape of her neck but before that she would come to we'd leave all the um the the doors in the house open and Callie would come down and check on Johnny and I and then when she saw we were okay she'd literally just wander in look at us and wander out and then go back up to mum and sleep so she was checking that we were all okay Oh, that's so beautiful. That's so beautiful. And my dog, Indy, I mean, I think she's a psychic dog and many, many dog owners say this because she's always at the window when I'm coming back and I, the drive I can see. So she can't hear me. She can't see me. But literally, I'm driving along and there's her face at the window. Like, oh. how does she know? know. And there's, I 
you might know that I um, do a lot of work in care homes and things as well. And there was one particular care home when they said about this cat that they had. And this cat would always go into one person's room or whoever it would be. And that would be the next person that would be ready to leave this world. The next person that was going to die. The cat would oh, be right. able to stay in that room. <laughs> so I'm putting cat flaps in my home. <laughs> yeah, the killer cat. You wouldn't want that, would you? Laying in bed, sort of feeling ill, and you look over and the little cat walks on the door. You're like, get out, get out, leave me be. <laughs> oh, well, well, also, well, coming on to a little story as well of um, Grey Friars Bobby, a dog. Yeah. In a dog in Edinburgh, and um, when his master died, he spent 14 years guarding the grave until he died. I mean, how lovely is that? How absolutely beautiful, darling. I think, oh, but you know, we've, we've to move on a little bit. I think we've got yep. to hear a sort of that's a lovely story. Let's hear one negative story and then one positive story from the very lovely Jack Piper. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Jack Tyler and we are in the beautiful county of Hertfordshire. Now this evening we're going to be taking you to some very historic sites all around Hertfordshire where we're hoping to find some paranormal activity. Now there has been loads of reported sightings of ghosts and um, ladies walking around in the night so hopefully tonight we'll see some of these things. But um, right now we are in the village of Datchworth which is actually the most haunted village in Hertfordshire. So here in Datchworth, we are standing along Rectory Lane. Now this lane here, um, people have said in the area that they've actually heard a cart late at night going up and down this lane. Now that could be the cart that was carrying the bodies of the Eves family. Because in 1769, the Eves family were found dead in their home and they actually starved to death. And the sad thing about it was their 11 year old son was found crawling amongst the corpses. So the police officers at the time decided that um, they wanted to cover this up. So they got a cart to take the bodies to the local church down the road where they were all buried in a mass grave. People have also reported seeing, seeing a cart with limbs hanging out also. So maybe these are the souls of these poor people who could never rest. So now we are in the village of Chewin and we are in the beautiful old church of St Peter's and I've got my partner in crime with me Donna Alexander. Hi, Hi Donna. everybody. And I've brought Donna with me because she's never actually been to this church but I wanted to show you around and tell you a bit of history about the place. So my aunt who is actually buried in this churchyard she was a bell ringer here for over 50 years and she told me that she saw um, a lady walking around in a, a cloak with a hood, a dark cloak with a hood, late at night, walking around the church and in between all the gravestones. And she saw her on a couple of occasions. And it's believed that it's the spirit of Lady Hester Sabine, who was a general's officer's wife. So, I mean, you're a skeptic like me, um, but we are open-minded. So what do you think about, about seeing a lady yeah, in a cloak? I mean as you know, I do believe in spirit and I do believe in, but to see somebody in their human form, that's what kind of makes me a little bit yeah, sceptical. Did she speak to her? She didn't speak to her, no. No, did she approach her? Did she go? I don't think, I think she might have been a little bit scared when she yeah, saw her. Yeah, she didn't fancy the first time. time for, over for a, a little drink. <laughs> the thing or... is, we all expect to see a lady in a cloak, don't we? Absolutely. In, a, in an yeah, old no, country course, churchyard. Yeah. So, you know, um, so who knows? Who knows? No, whether... no, absolutely. I, mean, I love the idea of it. I mean, there's nothing you want more than to, to think you can see your loved ones, you know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean. But one thing that did happen was this wall behind us. My dog actually, a few years back, ran up to this wall like he was barking at someone standing there. And obviously there was nobody there. I've got no explanation for it. So I don't know whether he was barking at spirit or what? I mean, there was no birds there or anything, so I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I've heard a lot of stories like that as well. I mean, so it does, it, you know, there's definitely a presence. There's definitely, I really, really strongly think that there's the presence of spirit around, I, and I feel it a lot mm. with my mum, as you know. I say that all the time, but yeah, but... Yeah, mm. but, well, let's see if this will change your mind. Yeah. I want to bring you over there. Okay. Because um, I want to show you um, a very special tomb. 
of oh, a lady exciting. called Lady Anne Grim Grimston. So let's let's go and have okay. a look over there. Okay, so this here is the tomb of Lady Anne Grimston, and um, she said she didn't believe in life after death. But the vicar, when she was dying, the vicar was he was worried about her soul, um, but she wouldn't change her beliefs. She said nope, you know, she doesn't believe in it, and that's it. And she said that if there is life after death seven trees would grow out of her tomb. So, as you can see here, the trees have actually grown out of her tomb. And that, that is incredible, actually. There. So, I mean, you know, how oh, would wow. you explain that, really? Well, are there seven trees? Well, I don't know if there's seven trees. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know there's seven trees. <laughs> that, no, that is, is incredible, isn't it? Yeah. No, seriously, that is amazing. I mean, come on. I mean, how could, no. you know, I mean, yeah. Because I did at first think, well, maybe somebody planted an acorn or something. Oh, but then, just playing to it. Do you think somebody's like... But then how would it grow? Exactly. It yeah. wouldn't be able it to get... through it. Grow yeah. through the tomb. Yeah, it's growing straight through the tomb. Yeah. And round the other side, they've actually, I mean, they've had to put this railing around to protect it. And they've actually got spikes. Going around the back to have a look. Yeah. Um, if you can see, there's like a, a, an iron spike there to, to hold it. Because it has actually grown through the tomb. Wow, it's incredible, it has. That's incredible, it really has. It's gone through the middle of it, hasn't it? Yeah. So, wow. Well, you can't explain that, can you? No. <laughs> wow. There's lots of history there. Lady Anne and Hester Sabine, the tomb, the trees, Hertfordshire really is haunted. So thanks for that, Jack. Yeah, thank you, Jack. And I'm so sorry. Look at time. Mitch, Mitch, we've, we've, we've done so well, but we've got to really come into thinking about playing the last tape. That is your next section, isn't it? I know. This is a really heartwarming story to finish off um, from a very dear friend of mine. <laughs> I'm reading the words of Dawn who sent this story in. In 2012, I went on a paranormal investigation to a fort just outside Portsmouth, never been on one before. So during the introduction, the team leader said to report anything, any strange sensations, noises, etc. So as we were doing the walk round, I kept getting the name Charles in my head really strongly. So I mentioned it and they asked, do I know anyone with that name, which I don't, but it was being said over and over and over. So the evening went on and at a vigil later, we'll be using a piece of equipment called Frank's Box, which goes through radio frequencies with the idea that spirits can speak through the radio waves. So the team leader said, is there anyone there who would like to make contact? And a voice said, yes. The team leader asked for a name and the voice said, Charles. So I said, that's the name I heard earlier. So the team leader said, Charles, is there anyone you would like to speak to? And Charles said, Dawn. So the next question was, Charles, what is your message to Dawn? And Charles said, I love you. So I told my mum and dad about this when I next saw them and Charles was my grandfather on my dad's side. He died when I was about four, so I don't really have much of a memory of him. I was getting divorced at the time, so I think he was saying he was there and supporting me and letting me know he was watching over me. It really was comforting. No. I really, I love that, you know, and that's what we need, isn't it? Particularly during these times, I think we do need a sense of comfort. And I, I know for me personally, you know, when my mum was dying and I was giving her some healing, she said she'd like to come back as a butterfly. Oh. And at the point of her cremation, as the curtains closed, a Red Admiral butterfly came down in a shaft of light and landed on the curtains. Everybody wow. saw it been written about amazing and then in the car going to where we were having drinks afterwards in the car was a red admiral butterfly <laughs> going up to london for her memorial there was a red admiral butterfly in the train carriage that i was in and then finally my mum would do shows with me and we do do them all around the world and obviously she died so it was the first time of doing this show without her with all my family and it was in the place which is very old place it was where Oscar Wilde wrote the importance of being earnest uh, it was Bramber House uh, near Stenning and we were performing one of my shows without mum 
And out of the chimney, this is December the 10th, we were doing this show, down the chimney, from out of the chimney, came a Red Admiral butterfly. It landed on my father's shoulder, my brother's scripts. The musicians were freaking out. They were absolutely like so amazed. And then we had this, and that was act two beginners. And all there was, there was just the fireplace and a tiny little casement window. And so I said, you've got to go. And you know how butterflies kind of flit and flee and you, whatever, don't go anyway. Yeah. The butterfly just went straight out through the window. So we then went to perform the second half of the show. Um, it went amazingly well because we were obviously all so buoyed up and, and sort of felt so bolstered up. And then there was a lovely standing ovation and I explained to the audience, I said, look, this is why we were so good and this is what had happened. And did anybody in the audience want to stay and talk about things like that, unexplained things that brought them hope, that brought them connection, that brought them joy? And everybody stayed, the whole audience stayed and talked for an hour about experiences they've had. And, and I think that, you know, for our next show, that we should really examine life after death a little bit more and those that have had near-death experiences, what have they seen and experienced and, 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 and really get the viewers out there as well to start thinking about the next aspects of our show to come. Well, absolutely. I mean, I've always been interested in life after death. I don't want to die now. I'm far too young. But I've got loads. I really enjoy life, but I'm also not scared of it. And um, and it'll be interesting to see if what we believe actually happens, you know, when we pass. So I'm really fascinated. It. But um, I've really enjoyed myself, Amanda. Thank you for co-hosting co our, our little show. And um, and thanks to everyone out there as well who's sent their tales in the Your Tales, the Lengro team. And also thanks everyone for all your comments. We couldn't put them all up because um, some of them wouldn't work in the sort of form that we were doing. But it's really lovely to see your and, and hear your tales as well. And remember, you can get involved in the next show. Just watch to the very end to see how to do it because you can contact Amanda and myself. Brilliant. So really all that's left to say is to say thank you and also to tune in next time if you dare